Nights. So uh, Friday, I spent the day in bed for approximately seven hours watching Aretha Franklin's funeral. If you didn't take off work, what were you thinking? <laughs> That's like one of my favorite things to do is watch people's send-offs. Like to, to sit and bear witness to the impact of a life and then to pay reverence to that life. I was officiating a memorial yesterday. I would have done the same with John McCain just to witness someone being celebrated. You know, we don't celebrate enough while living, but to sit when one has left their body and to bear witness to the impact is extraordinary. And I just want to be clear, Nathan Wright, if I precede you in death, uh, get the house clean first, do not let my mother in the door. <laughs> And um, I want like six, seven, eight hours and lots of music, lots of music. And like many eulogies, many eulogies. You know, like I would love to get to the point where I lay my body down and there's so much to say because it was such a life well lived. We actually do an exercise in uh, what this fall is called our conscious leadership program and uh, you write your eulogy. So you write your, your, your eulogy before laying your body down. It's a great map to indicate what matters to you. What do you want to be remembered for? What do you want to devote your life to? One of the things that, um, you know, there were a couple hiccups in the send-off, for those of you who watched. There was a couple folks that went rogue and I was screaming on the Facebook, like, get him off, get him off, someone run up there and get him off. But important to remember that the vast majority was gorgeous, powerful, beautiful. The mind will focus on what went wrong, but so much good. Isaiah Thomas, I loved what he said. He said, for Aretha, when the world was telling us ain't no way, she inspired us and told us otherwise. To be a voice on the planet that in the face of no agreement says there is a way. He went on to say that she shifted the consciousness of the world. She moved the universe by her being. He didn't say she moved the universe by her singing. She moved the universe by her being. See, there's lots of activity that we take part in in our lives, but the activity of your life is not as impactful as the beingness that inspires or mobilizes or moves the doingness. And so this month's series is titled, Who You Be. And the inquiry is really like, who well, okay, I'm gonna be real honest here. Uh, I do not see small children in the space. We were at a staff meeting and there have been some situations that occurred in the community and it became clear that we would be served by a conversation titled, Who Are You Being, Asshole? And we swiftly decided that that may not uh, be as effective as who you be. So, you know, the inquiry is to ask oneself, you know when you're being a jerk, right? It's like, you can feel it. And are you willing to be honest enough with yourself about being that one? And until you have cultivated a capacity of self-awareness to witness yourself being that way, very little is possible. The whole game of what we're up to here is awareness. My mentor, Michael Beckwith, said when he was here, February 15, 2007, have dominion over your awareness and you will have dominion over your destiny. 
The extent to which you have awareness or dominion over your awareness is the extent to which you are the creative capacity of your destiny. So a couple intentions for today. You know, I have been wildly inspired by the Conscious Leadership Group, which is a body of work that was created by Jim Dethmer, whom you know, and Diana Chapman. There have been two profound teachers for me in my life. And so uh, this, this, this program that we're rolling out this fall, there's an introduction to conscious leadership, and there's a program, the conscious leadership program, and it's all inside of this context. And the context really is the theme, the series for the month of September. So our intention today is to ask ourselves, where am I? So identify your orientation. If you have enough space between you and that which is occurring, pause and ask yourself, where am I? You can make a new choice. You've created a little bit of spaciousness between you and a hyperreactive state. And so Jim and Diana will oftentimes say the question really is location, location, location. Am I what they would call above the line? in an open and curious state, or am I below the line in a closed and defensive state? And the extent to which you can identify where you are is the extent to which you have access to freedom. If you are above the line, now the mind will make above the line better, <laughs> and then you will box yourself into being a good being, but that's not where freedom resides. You know, one of the great practices of this work is, in fact, to give yourself permission to feel your feelings all the way through so that when you are below the line in a closed defensive state, you don't rob yourself of being in a closed defensive state. You actually allow yourself to be in a closed and defensive state. And what might be a body gesture, body movement, nonverbal sound to match that so that you can move the energy? So our intention is to ask ourselves, where am I? Like you might ask yourself in this now moment, taking a deep breath in through your nose, allow your belly to soften. In this now moment, am I above the line in a state of openness and curiosity? Or am I below the line in a closed and defensive state? And would you be willing to have it be okay wherever you are? So that's really the practice over and over again. My other intention is to give us access to the formula because oftentimes you'll hear these things. I was looking at Facebook this morning and someone posted like the six steps to happiness. And it, like step one was like, let it go. And it's like, oh, <laughs> that sounds so easy. Well, how do you let something go? You don't just pretend like something isn't occurring on planet fill in the blank. The way you let it go is actually by giving yourself permission to feel what's authentically there. Now, as we've talked about many times before, your feeling state occurs like labor contractions, 90 second intervals. So if you actually give yourself full permission to be in whatever is occurring, it'll come in waves of no more than 90 seconds. If you find that an experience is going on for a prolonged period of time, you have found yourself not in a feeling state, but in a calcified mood. Feeling feelings being distinct from being trapped and stuck in moods. I have a few favorite moods you likely do also. There are a few topic areas that will uh, elicit a mood-based response because I have not taken responsibility for uh, applying the formula rigorously to this area of my life and the cycle perpetuates. Perhaps you have an area of your life that you find yourself in recurring struggle. Perhaps it is your place of work or your career. Perhaps it is in your intimate relationships. Perhaps it is in your money. Perhaps it is in your health. Perhaps it is in your spiritual life. An angsty, recurring state. 
consider that that's not actually native to you. That there is some storyline that you keep reinvesting in that keeps deepening and deepening and deepening. So my desire is for us to explore the formula, and I like to break down the formula in three aspects. Principle, and the principle that I'm interested in exploring today is oneness. So recognizing your spiritual nature, your true self, your essence. Practice, I think the most powerful practice on the planet today is just noticing. You could have a profound practice of meditation that could occur for you more like a safety blanket. And I would say that is not so powerful. If meditation for you is a getting away from dealing with what's right here, that's just a slick looking avoidance technique. Noticing is an active practice of awareness around what's occurring before you and what the mind is responding to. So the commitment is 100% responsibility. So the principle is oneness, the practice is noticing, the commitment is 100% responsibility. So 100% responsibility is important to understand the way you can check in and see if you are practicing 100% responsibility is by asking yourself, has blame and criticism ended here? Like around this issue, am I in the experiment of blaming and criticizing? Or am I in a neutral state? Now, as we all know, there are areas of life that we want something to be different than it is. But as we've talked about here before, wanting something and being willing to become the change are two entirely different things. So I have, um, I have a handful of recurring patterns in my life. One of them is Nathan and I are in a perpetual dance of too full to prioritize our relationship. And for kids, careers that we love, um, devoted to our careers, provide lots of reasons for why that makes sense. And neither of us are taking 100% responsibility or altering that. So long as we are blaming ourselves, blaming the other, or blaming the man, 100% responsibility is not living where I am, okay? So I would just invite you to ask yourself, where do I find my easily accessible blame and criticism to kick in? What are the circumstances in your life where blame and criticism of yourself of another or of them, where does that show up? And bring that into your mind's eye and just play with it for these 20 minutes. There is a concept that is used very significantly in the conscious leadership group called the drama triangle, also known as Cartman's drama triangle. It is based on this context of villain, victim, hero. And I want to talk about that for a moment. When we are in a state of drama, we are in a state of victim consciousness. And we are playing one of three or some of these roles. So the hero is looking for temporary relief to say and do things to make the immediate pain go away. The hero seeks value by, needing, by being needed by others. So we had a, a staff retreat this week, and you know, we're in an active practice of this work. And um, there was a conversation that was occurring in the staff retreat. And the question was asked, 
Are you heroing this other person? And my suspicion was this staff person was getting scared and was uncomfortable with the fear that was where they were. And the way that they knew to manage their fear was to seek relief by helping the other person. So just to notice the tendency. The villain, the typical response is to blame or criticize self, others, or the group. The victim is at the effect of. The circumstance or condition is doing something to cause one's life to be the way it is. They are powerless. The body gesture for the hero is like, I got this. The body gesture for the villain is like, you might figure out where I tend to default. <laughs> the body gesture for the villain is like, or the villain or victim, it's like, oh. So you likely have one that you favor. And you could start to explore in your relationships, both with yourself and others, where do you tend to bounce to? Now, the good news is that when you're not creating from drama and you're creating from presence, which is an open and awake state where curiosity and wonder resides, the counter experiences to these roles are as follows. The victim becomes the creator. They begin to take responsibility and they stop complaining. The villain becomes the challenger. So when I am in my high side, I bring healthy pressure to the creator. I bring healthy pressure to support them in facing and dealing with whatever they're dealing with. And the hero becomes the coach. The hero seeks to support, not to fix. Big distinction between supporting and fixing. A lot of times, people who identify as Transcendent folks, spiritual folks, they like to fix. And your fixing implies that someone else is broken. And the premise of this teaching is that all beings are whole, perfect, and complete. And that's not to suggest that there's not a part that you can play. It's just who are you being when you're participating? So, the first, I, I just love this. You know, when we talk about God, I'm going to use the word God a lot today, and some of you might be wondering, Lola, you've been telling us not to use the word God. The word God tends to trigger people, and if you have not deconstructed that word, my experience is it usually does more harm than good. So my preference is to not use the word God because as people are awakening to the power and presence that is in them, the word God still provokes an anthropomorphic idea that's externalized, like a man somewhere out there. That right there is the first move onto the drama triangle. To create an externalized deity is the first move in the human experience to the drama triangle. I am either a victim or a villain, and God is my hero. And right there, you've absolved yourself of personal responsibility. So there was a really brilliant thinker by the name of William Wark. He wrote a fab, he's written a number of books, he says, God is neither person, place, nor thing. God is everyone's potential. God is invisible energy intelligence. Consciousness is the degree of your God awareness. So the extent to which you understand that you are the presence of God itself is the extent to which you are operating from presence as opposed to operating from drama. <coughs> So the inquiry for me is always, when I'm experiencing suffering, where am I diminishing my potentiality? 
Where am I diminishing the power of the universe individualized as me? When it appears as if life is occurring from outside at you, where am I believing in an externalized presence? I went on Thursday night to a political fundraiser with our board president, Eileen Rhodes. And it was for a congresswoman. And there was a man by the name of James Lowry who spoke. And uh, James Lowry was born in Chicago in 1939 to two postal workers. He went on to um, go to Francis Parker, eighth grade through high school, uh, went on to the Peace Corps, ended up getting a law degree, ended up in 1969 being the first black person to be added to McKinsey Consulting. And he said something that was so profound. He said, I grew up with very little. And so the accumulation of wealth for me was a radical act. The accumulation of wealth for me was the way that I could get access for shifting the consciousness of humanity because the consciousness of humanity is embedded presently with power equals wealth. And so he knew that he was devoted to shifting the consciousness of humanity and the best way he knew to do that was through the accumulation of wealth. And so he said the importance of us giving to places that disrupt the status quo and call forward a higher idea of humanity is absolutely our imperative. Now what's interesting about that is I grew up among great wealth. The radical act for me was not the express accumulation of wealth. In fact, that was selling out from my perspective. And, and as I heard him speak, I left and Eileen and I had dinner and I was like, man, what he said, just the way he said it was so powerful. The accumulation of wealth for him was not just for the accumulation of wealth to create a greater sense of immediate individualized security. The accumulation of wealth for him was to give black people power through money. That's a very, very powerful context. And I noticed the one in me that went below the line to the closed defensive place and started to make myself wrong for not wanting to accumulate wealth. And Eileen said to me, no, 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 you're missing it. What you did, the life you've chosen, is a radical act. The expectation for your life was to just go along, to get along, and do this, do that, move here, marry that, make this kind of money. That was expected. And you didn't do that. You disrupted the system in you, and you made other choices. And that really hit me. Now, sometimes we can take things too far. <laughs> and I've had to remember, you did not say yes to being a martyr, Lola. And so the last 10 years have been about writing that for me. But you might ask yourself, what's the context that's driving your activity? What's the beingness that's moving you? You know, if I had been at Donaldson, Lufkin, and Genret, or Credit Suisse, or Chase, or Bank of America, inside of a context that being there was for a greater game, it would have changed who I was being. So you might ask yourself, what's the context you're living in? What's the game you're playing? What is the big idea of and for your life? If you are the individualized manifestation of all that is, if you are God awareness in form, what's the big idea? Why you? Why now? Why here? 
Who you be will make the difference. What you do is ancillary. So the invitation here is to consider transcending circumstances and conditions and to rise up into the high altar of consciousness. William goes on to say, when you know who you are, you accept responsibility. Through constant realization of your divinity, you are bypassing petty grievances and fears. How often do we allow ourselves to be distracted by petty grievances and fears? Consider that the degree to which you indulge your petty grievances and fears is the degree to which you are unwilling to take responsibility for the power that is you on the planet. When the distraction is your circumstances and conditions, the reasons and considerations, consider that you are dishonoring God as you. The exciting thing about the place that we are and the consciousness of humanity is that there is a, an awakening to that. You know, my experience is that the practice of noticing is really about discernment. Being able to have an honest conversation with myself about where am I. And I absolutely know that the willingness that we each have to do, to do the work within ourselves is the thing that's going to make the difference. A student at a local university reached out to me this week and said, I would like to have a scholarship for normal white people because I'm doing my thesis on white arts administrators. And I said, okay, well, you're welcome to take the course so long as you understand that the course is not intended for you to have an academic exercise on white arts administrators. If you would like to take the course so that you start to begin to untangle what's occurring in your subconscious mind and you want to apply this to your internal landscape, then I would love to have you in the course. And if that somehow informs your thesis, then beautiful. But if I have someone come in and explore the conversation of one's racial consciousness from an academic perspective, without understanding how they're entrenched in the thing, we keep playing the same game. If each individual on the planet would begin with a willingness to take 100% responsibility, not more, hero move, not less, victim move, they'd be willing to take 100% responsibility for where we are at any given moment, we would see a shift. So William goes on to say, there are times when you meet someone that you might think could not possibly have the Christ within, always remembering that the Christ has nothing to do with Jesus. If you are new to Bodhi Spiritual Center and you don't know what I mean, there are many among us that have or could use the context of the Christed one. The potentiality of the Christed one exists in each of us. It's our true nature. It's the I am presence. There are times when you meet someone that you might think could not possibly have the Christ within. Do you know that person? Perhaps their actions reveal nothing but hatred and ugliness. This only shows one of two things. Either they have separated themselves in thought from their God self, or you are caught up in judging their personality by appearances. Great inquiry. To notice, have they forgotten who they are and or Am I in a reactive, judgmental disposition? And we talked about last week that there are no good people and bad people. There are only good people that have forgotten who they are. And if we would each take responsibility for keeping our side of the street clean, 
we'd be all right. Your spiritual development is not a matter of developing your spirit. It is already fully developed. Your spiritual development comes from developing your awareness of the perfection that already is. That is the great human journey, is to, with great devotion, wake up to your divinity. Wake up to the big idea of God as you. That is an exciting game to play. And the areas of life that I'm presently experiencing recurring discomfort and dissatisfaction, I have to be honest with myself and ask myself, where am I believing that something is happening to me? Where do I believe that there is some way I would love, no, 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 let me just tell you. Let me, tell, let me tell you about these circumstances and conditions. They're not right. Let me tell you what he did. It's not right. <laughs> no freedom on planet Lola. And that him is just going about his merry way. So you know that old slogan, Resentment is like taking poison, expecting the other person to die. <laughs> we each have the opportunity to be an Aretha Franklin, a John McCain, a Jesus of Nazareth, a Mother Teresa, an Audre Lorde. We each have the opportunity to do that. The question will be, in this lifetime, are you ready to wake up to your responsibility? That's it. Peace and many blessings. <laughs>